All right, well, if you'll, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we'll get into our study this evening. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, I didn't bring my, my slideshow today. We're, we're going through, uh, we, we've gone through the book of Ephesians, obvi- obviously just have surveyed it, looking at this issue of suffering and wh- how Paul talks about suffering in the book of Ephesians. And when you come to the epistle to the Ephesians, uh, the way in which Paul deals with suffering, again, he's already dealt with it in a, in a very in-depth manner. Um, well, let's read it and then pray and then we'll get into our study. Otherwise, I'll forget to pray and forget to read. So uh, if you look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, and we'll read to verse 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can uh, gather together. We thank you for this day uh, that we can redeem unto your honor and glory. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he did for us there at Calvary. Uh, And by by simple faith in what he did, uh, we can be justified unto eternal life, meaning we can have all of our sins forgiven, past, present, and future, uh, and be imputed Christ's perfect righteousness uh, unto us. And Father, we thank you for that wonderful gift that you extend to us freely by your grace uh, because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, what he did there at Calvary. But Father, we thank you for uh, what you've also provided in the cross as far as our edification goes, the building up of our inner man to be conformed to the image of Christ, that we may have a heart after your heart, that we would think the way that you think, that we would Uh, conduct ourselves the way that you would conduct yourselves and that we would labor with you in what you're laboring in. And Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege to be able to be conformed to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we look at this issue of suffering and as we just highlight it through our edification, through Paul's epistles, I pray that we would apply our hearts to understanding these matters, uh, understand that although we may not feel them, we may not see them, uh, we may not experience them, uh, the way in which we, we would think we would, that we would realize that it's real and that we need to look at these things and view these things with the eyes of our understanding, not just our physical eyes. And um, Father, we thank you for the, the impact that we can make in the heavenly places unto your honor and glory. Uh, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, as I was saying, the issue of suffering takes a different dimension in the book of Ephesians Paul has gone through a lot regarding this issue as we looked at the major portions, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 12, and now we've kind of been surveying Ephesians. And uh, Paul's dealt with the issue of suffering, one that he's not removing, uh, he's not going to remove you from suffering. You're going to go through what he calls, first of all, the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings that are common to man. Everyone experience them, experiences them just because you're now a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to be removed from them. You don't get any kind of special deliverance from them. Uh, and then he talks about the, the, the next form of suffering is the sufferings of Christ, which those sufferings are particular Those are the ones that only a Christian can go through because they're the ones making known the gospel of Christ, making known his word. And so the sufferings that come from that are are, um, uncommon to man and they're specific to members of the church of the body of Christ, to believers today. And it's those that we've been really starting to look at now, the sufferings of Christ. 
And in Ephesians, he, again, he's laid the groundwork. Now he's going to start building on top of it. And what he does is he explains the wonderful and grand impact that you can make in suffering. Again, he provides for you through his word working in you, uh, which is the greatest form of his power. He calls it the excellency of his power that he provides for you to endure through the sufferings, no matter what the adversary or this world can uh, bring against you. He provides with his word so that you can have this uh, strength, the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ operating within us to help us to endure. And not only that, but also at the same time, give us comfort in the suffering. So he doesn't remove us from the suffering, but rather in the suffering, the, the glory of his word working in us, is just that. It's excellent and it glorifies God. And we, are, we have the honor and privilege of being that vessel to bear God's word working in us in the midst of the most tr- uh, uh, trying times in our life. And uh, Ephesians takes that and, and spotlights it and magnifies it that the impact that we're making, it, it does have an impact in this world, but it's our primary impact is in the heavenly places. And when that takes place, when we have God's word working in us in suffering, the, both the holy angels and the, the devil and his angels are both looking and observing God's power in his word working in us. And it, glor- it redounds to his glory. And the, the holy angels, they rejoice. And uh, I can't wait to eventually get there through our edification on Sundays and take a look at this in, more in depth in, in the reality of this. And we looked at some things regarding angels, the innumerable company. We saw John there in Revelation. He's looking and he can't, he just says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands upon thousands of angels, just a whole bunch of them. And Hebrews says an innumerable company of them. And they're observing us today in this dispensation of grace and God's word working in us. And when that takes place, again, it redounds to God's glory. And Ephesians highlights that very issue. And what we've gotten to here in Ephesians chapter 6 is that the way Paul talks about these sufferings now, he talks about it as a a war that we wrestle. And it's not a carnal, a fleshly uh, battle or war. It's it's what would would be called spiritual warfare. That's what it commonly would be described as. Now, there's a lot of connotations that go with that terminology, spiritual warfare. We have to make sure that it lines up with God's word. It's not that the adversary doesn't utilize men. But the issue is not so much the men, but what's coming out of their mouth, what their doctrine is, what their teaching is. The battle, the battlefield is the battlefield of, of, of the word of God. And that's why it's so important to understand God's word, not only in its context, but also rightly divided so that you're not in, in God's program with the nation of Israel being all confused and, and taking promises and provisions that are given to them and applying them to you today as, as a member of the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ has their own provisions, own promises that we are to uh, utilize and, and hold on to and stand in. Um, but if that takes place, that's where, again, that's where the war is. That's where the battle is taking place. And what we've been going through is the policy of evil against us. And it's in three phases. The first phase is that he's going to attack the message. Or the, he's going to attack the doctrine. He's going to do that by confusing it. Uh, there's just a whole, a whole bunch of tactics that he has in trying to accomplish phase one of his policy of evil to attack the, the message, t- attack the doctrine. Um, and it, it wouldn't be a very good tactic if the adversary came out and just showed who he was. Hey, I'm Satan, I'm an adversary. No, he makes it look like God. He makes it look, he, that's what uh, Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 10. He's transformed into an angel of light. And his ministers are cha- uh, transformed into uh, ministers of righteousness. So it sounds good, it looks good. It's got a good feel to it, all these things, but yet it's not of God. And um, that's the first phase. The second phase is the issue of if he can't get you, if he can't attack the message, if you got the message and you're standing in it, the second phase is he's going to attack the messenger. He's going to come after you. If that doesn't work, he's then, it, it, the, the third phase is similar to the second phase, but it's, it's a little different. He's going to, if that doesn't work, he's going to try to discredit you or discourage you. 
And he's going to, if, you, if you're in a state of, uh, of, of reputation or a position of reputation and things like this, he's going to try to get you in, in, in some kind of sin so that uh, what, you've, what you're teaching, if you're standing for the truth, that he can come along and discredit you. And you kind of get an idea of this if you see the, you know, the big pastors in their mega churches and you see that they're caught up in some kind of idolatry or, or something like that. And it comes along and it, and it can ruin their, their ministry. And discredit everything that they say. Well, that's, that's a similar issue to the third phase of, of Satan's policy of evil. And we've been looking at that. But what we now start to look at is the armor of God. And the armor of God here in Ephesians 6 uh, provides, is, is provision against those three phases. We've already looked at the issue of, if you look at Ephesians 6 and verse 14, he says, Stand therefore... Having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we looked at those three pieces. Those are the three pieces of armor that a Roman soldier at that time or, or soldier would put on first. They would put on their, their girdle, they would put on their, their breastplate, and they would put on their, their, uh, their feet armament. And we looked at that as far as the spiritual aspects of them. The, the issue of truth and, and the issue of righteousness and the feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. And then he, we, we saw that, that those three pieces of armor protect against the first phase of, of Satan's policy of evil. And the next piece of armor, this issue of the shield of faith here in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We looked at that one as well. And that one alone uh, provides for the protection against phase two of his policy of evil. We already went through all this. I'm just kind of reviewing it right now. Um, and now we're going to get into the pieces of armor that protect and provide against the third phase of the policy of evil. And that is what he talks about here in verse 17. He says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Um, these two specific pieces of armor, when taken up by us with full appreciation for them, protect us from ever being completely discouraged or despondent when it comes to the policy of evil against us. The helmet... Uh, some things regarding the helmet at that time and how uh, we are to understand this issue of the helmet of salvation. The helmet that a soldier wore had a twofold purpose. It naturally provided protection for the head, but it also bore the, in, in the, the sign of his country and identified him for who he was as a soldier in the honored service of his country. The helmets bore distinctive or, uh, ornaments that conveyed dignity and reminded the soldier of the privilege that was his in being so chosen of his country to serve in its defense and pursuits. And we can have an idea of this even today. Our, our uh, military and things like this, they have similar things uh, of this. The certain things that the gear that they wear provide this honor and, prov and show this honor and the dignity of serving their country. And, and specifically the branch of, of the military that they're in. Uh, so, so it is with us. And the provision God made us uh, has made for us in the helmet of salvation. The doctrine of our salvation, which we have been given as the gift of God through faith in Christ Jesus, is designed by God to work both as a protector and a dignifier in the battle. As protection, the knowledge of our salvation protects us from the discouragement that the wiles of discrediting, disappointment, and weariness want to produce. Just because you're saved by grace through faith in what Christ did there on the cross doesn't mean that's just put away and never to be used again. Here it's a part of the, uh, the whole armor of God as far as the helmet. And it protects us. And, and again, it, it, um, and it's a, it's a, it serves as a dignifier. We do not look for the, the, the reformation of the world through our efforts. We do not look for the alteration of the course of this world. We do not look for bringing in of God's kingdom. We do not look for the betterment of this world at all. Instead, our blessed hope is God's deliver us, deliverance of us from this world by His coming for us before He judges it in His wrath. Hence, we have no reason to be discouraged or despondent or depressed by the weariness of the battle. Rather, the exact opposite of what we ought to be. The helmet of salvation taken up by us sees to it that such discouragement doesn't settle in. Our, our blessed hope 
is a part of this issue of our salvation. And again, if you get caught up in the world, the course of this world, and and you get caught up in in the, the corruption of our government, and you get caught up in all these worldly things, there's a tendency that when you do that, of discouragement. Our government is corrupt. It's going to stay that way. It's, uh, the, uh, the world's going to get the course. Of, it's, it's on a course. And you can't go against that course. You can try to, I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't go out there and, and serve good causes. But if you get wrapped up to, in that and make that your hope and, and changing the world to be that your hope, uh, it's going to let you down. But the, the issue of your salvation and the blessed hope of your final deliverance, that's what ought to be surrounding your mind. That's what you should be caught up in. And the adversary is very, very subtle and very, very good at getting you caught up in the course of this world and the many areas of it. That time could be spent in your edification as far as building yourself up to be conformed to the image of Christ and looking at those things the way that God looks at them. That's what our goal ought to be. Uh, This helmet of salvation is also designed by God to underscore for us the dignity of fighting the good fight of faith and warring the good warfare. God tells us that it is a good fight, therefore it ought to be looked upon with honor and as a privilege of of God's grace unto us. Again, this can be seen regarding uh, our soldiers and things like this. They, they stand in, in our, they, they, per, they go to war for us. And that's, a, that's an honorable thing. Well, when it comes to our, the war that we should engage in as far as the, the, the spiritual battle uh, as, as Christians, if you've got a Christian soldier, they're, they're in two battles. But nevertheless, we should all be engaging in this, in this battle, this, this war. And it's, a, it's an honorable thing. It's a good fight. Some wars aren't good. Some battles aren't good. They've still got to be fought. they still got to be won. they still got to go out there and accomplish what they're supposed to accomplish. But some of them aren't good in the first place. But nevertheless, this one is, is a good fight. This one is, is, is one that God uh, is engaged in. The honored privilege of making that impact to the glory of God's manifold wisdom in the face of the principalities and powers in the heavenly places ought to thrill our souls. Again, that's what Ephesians is all, Ephesians is all about. The knowledge of our salvation and what it is that we are saved unto in God's plan and purpose ought to dignify our heads, just as his country's colors on his helmet dignify the soldier's head. The knowledge of who and what he was in his country's honored service work to enliven the soldier, especially in the face of the most trying times. So also has God designed the helmet of salvation do for us uh, in the face of the trying wiles of, the, of Satan's third line of attack, God has designed the helmet of salvation to encourage and enliven us. That soldier, where they're in that, that tough time and they're in that, that in trouble on every side, one of the things that can encourage them to, to go on, to endure, and do what they have to do to, save, to stay alive or to save their, their, uh, uh, their soldiers next to them, their, their friends and their, their brothers and sisters in battle, uh, is standing for their country. Now, there's a lot of other issues of motivation, but that one is that they represent their country. And that provides a motivation to do what they need to do in battle. Well, the helmet of salvation should provide that very thing for us as well. Uh, again, I want to talk about this, this next issue, the sword of the Spirit. Again, we're just kind of surveying this. I know I'm talking a lot. We're going to eventually get some other passages here. But I just wanted to go through this in, in survey-type form. This sword here is identified for us for what it is. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in, there in verse 17. It's provision against the discouraging tactics of of, the, of, of phase three of the policy of evil ought to be obvious by its description. One of the easiest ways of becoming discouraged in the battle is to think that success is dependent upon our own wit, wisdom, and words. Or to think that dealing with opposition and contrary doctrine requires wielding the weapon of one's own intelligence and having to use one's own capacity to construct good arguments and make persuasive presentations that will win others over. When we do this, we war the good warfare as if it was our own battle. 
We wrestle as if it is by our own strength that an impact will be made. And this is, a, this is again, this is one that's common uh, in, in Christianity. Is not providing the answer that God gives. And usually it comes from a lack of faith in God's word and the faith on, on the part of the believer describing something to an unbeliever um, or, or it, when, in regards to contrary doctrine. But the, the word of God provides for us, as we explain, that's what we're going over on, on Sundays in Romans 1, 2, and 3 and the issue of Romans 2. And we're talking about those escape tactics and how to respond to them. We're supposed to respond to him with the, with the word of God and how he does it. And not on our own ability, not by our own uh, you know, good terminology, not by our own imagination, not by our own intelligence and wit and, and, and all those things. But with God's word, that's what's designed to make that impact. Well, the word of uh, the sword of the spirit does that. The issue in the battle, however, isn't what we say, it is what God says. God has not separated himself from his word. His word is not our sword in our hands, but it is the sword of the Spirit in our hands. In essence, the Spirit of God declares to us, just wield the sword and leave the outcome to me. The Apostle Paul recognized this and operated on this as he suffered excuse me, under the effects of, the, of phase three of the policy of evil. In the midst of these most trying, uh, of his most trying experience from the discrediting tactics, he was not dis, uh, he was not discouraged. As saints by the droves were de- departing from him, and he was bound in prison, he was not discouraged. He knew that what he wielded was the sword of the spirit, and the, uh, the sword of uh, sorry, the spirit of God was not restrained. He says over there in Second Timothy two nine that the word of God is not uh, a bound. I believe that's the the passage he says. The, Paul here was in prison. And they, they were, if you, if you know, he's in Ephesus, when he's writing to the saints of Ephesus here, uh, he's in prison. But then if you go over to Timothy, and we'll eventually get there, uh, and he deals with Timothy, and Timothy was a pastor there in Ephesus, and he's explaining, uh, he explains some things to Timothy. He says that they all uh, have, uh, those in Asia and things like that have uh, uh, departed from me. And they departed. They were departing from the Apostle Paul because he's in prison. He's standing for the Word of God. He's looked at as crazy. He's looked at as as an evil doer. But yet he's the one. And so he's obviously, if people are leaving him, he's being discouraged. He, he, it's it's easy for him to be discouraged. If you put yourself in that situation, that would probably be your and, and my response as well. Is if you get thrown in prison for the word of God, how other people view, how other people view you and look at the what you're preaching, you're going to think that that it's 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 not working and and I can't serve the Lord here in prison. All these things, but Paul he had he learned some things and he was able to take the sword of the Spirit, know what it was able to do, and even in prison be able to wield that that sword of the Spirit. We must learn that success in the battle isn't determined by the results that we want to see. It isn't measured by what we consider to be victory, nor by what society or religion or popular thought says it is. And I can't tell you how important that is to believe and get in your head. It's not about what's popular. In fact, the Lord, uh, in the Gospel accounts, the Lord says, what is, what is uh, highly esteemed among men is an abomination to the Lord. And what you see which is highly esteemed among men should always throw up a red flag. Because the flesh, the natural flesh, is at enmity toward, at, with God. It's just naturally opposed and adverse to God. And you have a course of this world that is just opposed to God. There, you can come along and say, well, you know, there's some good things and the things that people are doing and things that they're saying. And, that, and that's not bad, but they, what, what God's concerned about is godliness. You can have an idea of love, but is it the same idea? Has it come from what God thinks about love or peace or justice or judgment, whatever the issue is? 
It should be what God esteems uh, regarding those issues. And you have that same mind so that you can come along and, and with the Apostle Paul there in 1 Corinthians 2, have the mind of Christ, not just your own mind and your vain imaginations. That might sound good, might have a good presentation to it, but is, is not based upon godliness. When that takes place, yea, all those that shall live godly shall suffer in, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so that's what's going to naturally take place. Um, but again, it shouldn't, victory, it isn't the victory or the outcome isn't measured by what we consider to be victory, nor by what society or religion or popular thought says it is. Success in the battle is determined and measured by what, uh, by what he says it is. Standing for the truth against the tactics of the policy of evil is success in the battle as far as God is concerned. When we operate on that, we have no reason for discouragement either. Come with me and look at verse uh, Ephesians 6, look at verse 13 and 14 with me. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, that you may be able to, what? Stand. Withstand in the evil day, and having done all to, what? Stand. stand. Verse 14, what's that first word? Stand. Standing in the battle is considered Victory. In, in, in this battle, in this warfare. Being able to get the doctrine and then be able to stand on it and stand in it against everything that comes your way. Are there any questions regarding, again, I know we didn't get into every single detail. Was there any questions, what we went over regarding the, the armor of God and the, the, the policy of evil? Again, we could go through it in, in much more detail, but I didn't want to uh, do that in, in this series. Joyce? Um, I'm not sure if maybe this is on another message where I can get it just off the internet, but mm-hmm. um, the second phase or whatever you said is attacks the messenger. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just give a couple samples of that, or should I just listen to the tape? Yeah, I, I don't know if I gave a lot of samples, but if you go back and, and uh, read... 2 Corinthians 11, I think, that, I think it's 11, it might be 10, uh, where Paul lists all those things that he goes through. Uh, chapter 11 there, starting in uh, verse 23. The adversary, if, if, he can't get you, if he can't get you to not stand in the message, the doctrine, if he can't get it to be corrupted in your mind in some manner, he's going to come after you. Um, and so he has many different means. That's where the sufferings of, of Christ really start to come in. Uh, that could be you're sharing the gospel, you're sharing the word with someone, and they, are, uh, they don't receive it, they don't deal with it honestly in their heart, and so they uh, blaspheme against it, they, they ridicule you for it. In Paul's day, and even some people experience this even in our day, in our country, you know, physical persecution, uh, that's what Paul was, was receiving. And so it's that type of persecution. My understanding goes farther than that. Uh, my understanding is that the adversary is able to do things against you at that point um, that actually look like the sufferings that are common to man. Uh, he's able to... Uh, he, he's able to produce uh, financial insecurity. You know, he's able to do those things at that, that point. Um, and so you start seeing these issues of what Paul was facing regarding uh, not having clothing and not having food and not having all these things. Uh, those were just at one point, and those were just what everyone was, I mean, there's, there's, those were common to some people at his time. Uh, but Paul starts to eventually talk about them regarding the coming from his standing for the truth is those things are being taken away from him and he's recognizing it as this policy of evil against him. Um, in Romans 8, if you look at Romans 8, uh, when he starts to deal with the sufferings of Christ for the very first time, uh, he actually goes into this very issue in verse 35, Romans 8 verse 35. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress 
or persecution. And then he says, or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword. He's talking about the advers- the who there is the adversary, and he's able to produce that famine, that nakedness, pearl and peril and, and sword. And so uh, that can take place against the, the messenger. Um, my understanding is you're not going to experience those things until you're more in your edification. You know, you're you're a little bit more advanced. But um, my understanding, he can he he's he's able to do that. So. Are there any other questions, Cody? Um, kind of goes along with your question. Like, is there like a cutoff point where you go from like learning to where the point where you can actually go out and like engage in this warfare, and then like these, these like the tribulation, the distress, just like starts the adversary just starts producing them. Mm-hmm. Um. My understanding, that's, that's a good question. My understanding is as soon as you learn the information and you're committed to getting it in you and, and have it effectually work, you are supposed to, as well as an adult, a responsible adult uh, son and daughter of, of, of your father, uh, put that to use right away. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, as soon as you learn it, you go out the door. I mean, that's fine too. But you're responsible to also have it work out in the details of your life. You're supposed to be minding those things and putting those things into practice. So, um, yeah, when we get through the issue on Sundays about the gospel of Christ and, and how to share it with others, uh, we're responsible not only to get that information, but also responsible to, uh, and you don't have to, you have the freedom to, to not uh, but God desires it to, and, he, and, and it's unto his, unto his glory and, and ours as well. Um, and so you're responsible to go out and, and share that information or have it or, you know, whatever, whatever doctrine it is, whether it's the gospel, the mystery, um, issue of godly love and charity, whatever it is, you're supposed to put that to work in, in, the, in your life. So does that help? So like the more you're built up, the more you can be able to communicate the gospel of Christ, the, the more the adversary sees you as like a target. Exactly. The yep. more sufferings. Exactly. Yep. If you if, if if you're learning, if he can get if he can attack the message in your life so that you're either believing something that you shouldn't be believing, he's got you. That you're not making the impact. You might have. Bible, biblical terminology and be talking about God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and all these things. But it's in Israel's program and it's, it's doctrine that shouldn't be taught in, or, or shouldn't be uh, being followed expressly to you today. He's got you. And so no matter what you're going out and sharing, we're actually going to look at that. If it, the, the, we're, going to, we're going to look at that. The, we're going to see it in Timothy about striving lawfully. There's rules to not only edification, but there's rules to reward and, and suffering as well. And if you're not following that, then you can, you can suffer in vain. You can go through suffering and it count for nothing. Um, and so, but yeah, once you get that in you and it's working, and then you're, you're also going out there and, and having it work out, then yeah, you're, you're a target for the, I, I, he's, he sees you as a serious threat. And so he's going to bring on these three, three phases. Jess? Uh, and kind of to underscore some of the things that you're saying, uh, addressing it right there, while well, I look at 2 Corinthians 6, you know, uh, 4 through 10, it goes through the issues of some of the different kind of sufferings that can actually come upon us and like what it works in us uh, in verses, say, uh, 6, uh, 6, 7, and 8. Um, uh, and, and then uh, and this issue of what it looks like in the world that you were saying then. Um, this idea of what we would consider victory isn't necessarily what the victory truly is. Exactly. And, you know, that's addressed down in the, in the latter verse. Yeah, that's good. He, you know, he says some things there as, as he labors. Uh, it's, I'm glad you brought that up, Chaz. He says, uh, why don't you, why don't everyone turn there? Second Corinthians 6. He's, he's actually talking about the being an ambassador for Christ and being a labor together with God. 
uh, there in 2 Corinthians 5, and he moves that into to chapter 6. Uh, look at verse 1. He says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. I'll jump down to verse 3. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. So it's not necessarily you're going to be looked at as all wonderful and, and have a good report against you. You might actually have an evil report against you. Um, as deceivers and yet true. They're looked at as deceivers, but yet they're, they're, they're true. As unknown, yet well known. That's what Twin Cities Grace Fellowship is. We're unknown, but yeah, we're, well, we're, we're, we're known across the, the whole world. You know, I shared with you that guy that called me from Manchester, uh, England, uh, David Bond. And so, and, and there's, I mean, there's more stories, and you can see that even on our website. As dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always, always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. And so Paul, he was in a certain state and condition, but he knew what he was giving and he knew what he was getting was he had nothing, but yet he knew that he possessed all things. And you have to understand what that is. It's, it's not worldly things. He understands what he's possessed, what he possesses as far as the spiritual blessings and and, and so forth. But yeah, that's a wonderful passage um, to help you understand that, that how the world might view you doesn't necessarily mean what you're doing is wrong. Um, so. Yeah, it appears that phase one is Satan's most effective tactic. You mentioned 90% of Christianity is taken out at phase one. They confuse the doctrine. I said 90%? I think you said it was up there. Oh. It's really high percentage. Well, I'll take that. I'll take that back. If I said ninety percent, I don't know if I want to put a percentage on it. But, but it, yeah, it is. It's a very. That's the adversary has so many different wiles when it comes to God's word, is to get you either back in Israel's program or forward in Israel's program, confuse confuse your your translation so you can be reading something but it not even be God's word. Uh, you know, not understanding the context properly. I mean, Paul battled this in every church that he established. Uh, he, he says there, even in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in, in context of this warfare, but he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There in verse, uh, you know, you can read it down, those, those first six verses of chapter 10. But everywhere, in, and he's talking about in the church. He's not just talking about in the world. That's, that's, that's implied. That's implied from Romans 1. The vain imagination. He's saying now that they're saved doesn't mean that they're vain imaginations and they're corrupted foolish thinking and adding something to the text, taking it away, not rightly dividing it. All these things don't take place. And so he's saying in the church, He's dealing with these, these uh, strongholds, these imaginations. And uh, it, it is, it's a common thing. It's a common thing to take something out of its context, string it with another passage that usually is in Israel's program or somewhere, take that one out of its context, string those together, take another one, take it out of its context, string it together, and form a conclusion. And you have your, a self-concocted doctrine that God had said nothing about. But because, oh, well, it, this is part of God's word, this is part of God's word, this is part of God's word, and we put it all together, boom, it's still God's word. And that's, God's word is never meant to be handled that way. And he says you can improperly handle his word. And so it's a, it's a serious matter. And so, yeah, that's the first one, first phase that he's going he's gonna to do is, is attack the, the word. So. When you get past and you get through, like, we are in right division, and it seems that you, you're not... You're able to discern phase one. Now you get that attack the messenger. Do you know that you're you're in that smaller category of believers? Now, when you get 
Just because just because you know right division doesn't mean you're out of phase one. Not at all. Why not? Because you can go through Paul's epistles and still take things out of context. You cannot understand them in their proper sense and sequence. And so you can you can come along and say something it's just like anything else. You can come along in, in Paul's epistles, understand it's he's your apostle, and do the same exact thing when he doesn't that it's not designed to be that way. And so you can he can still just because you understand right division doesn't mean that you're out of phase one yet. Um, he says in Ephesians, do not walk in the way of the gen- as other Gentiles walk in the dark in the darkness of their own yep. Because you mentioned that even at that level, you're in Ephesians, a higher level, and you're still being admonished by God yeah. not to walk in the way of the Gentiles. Yep. Yeah, at every level, you're you're susceptible to the policy of evil. Okay. As we talk about edification, the foundation, Romans through Galatians, the superstructure, Ephesians through Colossians, and the superstructure or the 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 roof or the capstone being First uh, and Second Thessalonians. At each one of those levels, the policy of evil can be against you because you're you're now at another level, and so you've gotten through level the sufferings at level one, but now you're at level two, and so. Phase one, he's going to try to corrupt the doctrine at that level, uh, uh, corrupt the message at that level. If you stand in that and you move on, then he's going to come and try to attack you. So that's and that's why Paul's Paul Paul went through phase two when, in in Romans through Galatians. He was getting buffeted and, and and physically persecuted, but he wasn't thrown in prison. And when you reach Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, he's thrown in prison. And so that's, that's phase two at that level. Um, so, But I want to move on. I, I, we got a little bit more time. I want to get into Philippians here. If you turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Those are good questions. We're, we'll have time for more as we go forth. Uh, but look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians is a book that one of the main issues is this issue of suffering. Again, Paul's in prison. And I want to start to look at chapter 1 here. And I want you to see the, the sense of sequence, the, the order of what's taking place, um, as well as what Paul's doing here with the Philippian saints. Look at Philippians chapter 1, and look at verse 12 with me. He says, But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now he comes along again here in verse 12. He says, but I would, would you should understand. Why does Paul say that? Where were you reading it from? Oh, I'm sorry. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. Yep. Why would he come along and say, but I would, ye should understand? <coughs> Yeah, because 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 some yeah some of they them don't understand or maybe they do. Look at look what he says here in. Look at verse twenty nine, the same chapter, verse twenty nine. He says, "For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the what." The same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. The Philippians, Paul's in prison. The Philippians now are starting to see and starting to experience the same conflict that's in Paul. They're starting to go to prison for, for the message. And there's a tendency for them to faint. That's what the policy of evil is designed for you to do. To throw in the towel for you to stop sharing the message. To discredit you and, and discourage you. And so they get thrown in prison, and I mean, just think about how that would be. Think about how if I was in prison, think if I was thrown in prison tomorrow. Think about how people will look at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, and think about how people will look at me. And not only that, because you're associated, how they think about you. Now, I think I'm a pretty nice guy, and don't see why I would be thrown in prison. And you all know that, but the world doesn't. And then you get the spin, especially in this day and age with the media. Now, we probably wouldn't get media attention. But nevertheless, just to, throw, to get my point across, it has an impact. So they see Paul in prison, 
and they they see that, and they're you know you can kind of see the hesitation, but now but then they, they they continue on, but now they're starting to go through the same conflict, and they're starting to be thrown in prison. Now you got a real big holding back. So Paul writes the epistle to the Philippians. It says, "But I would that you should understand, brethren." That the things which happened unto me, being in prison, these sufferings, have uh, the things that which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He gives them assurance that just because he's in prison, what what he's doing isn't wrong, and it's not hindering his ministry, but rather it's producing a furtherance of the gospel. And why is he saying all this? He says in verse 13, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without what? Fear. They're starting to experience a fear. Who wouldn't? If you're the threat of going to prison, you'd experience fear. Paul's writing to them say, Hey, What's taking place? Some brother, they're waxing confident to speak the word of God more boldly and without fear. To, to, to build them up and show them not to faint, not to be fearful of this, but to follow their brethren, follow the Apostle Paul and what he's doing, and, and continue to share the word in boldness and without fear. And so, again, that's why I was reading. Now, in verse 15, verse 18, he talks about how, he's, how some are preaching. Some are preaching Christ uh, of envy and strife and of contention, and some sincerely. But then he gets to verse 18. He says, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preaching, therein I do re- rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Comes along and says, they're, they're waxing confident, but some are doing it not properly. Some are. But nevertheless, hey, Christ is being preached. And then he gets in verse 19, and this is the verse I want to focus on. Uh, He says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now he says here, "For, For I know. He's not coming along and saying, I don't know. He's not coming. He's saying, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. That's growth. He, he's not coming along and saying, I don't know how I'm going to handle this situation. I don't know how I'm going to handle being in prison, facing phase two of the policy of evil at level two of my edification. If he didn't know, he, he's got to go back and get something. And hopefully we've done that so we should know what shall turn to salvation. We should know that this salvation isn't a salvation from prison. If it was that, he wouldn't say what he says here in verse 20. He says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also uh, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by what? Death. He's not thinking he's going to be saved from prison and from death. But the salvation is that he remains bold to speak the word without fear at, 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 at being in prison. That Christ would still be magnified in his body. But again, this issue for I know. the whole, why, would, why would he tell the Philippian saints that? He, he's really just saying, this is what I know. This is what I'm doing. Why would he tell them that? They're scared. They're, they're scared? Yeah. Well, they may end up in there. Right. Facing the same thing. Right. Facing the same thing. So how do they need, they need to know something as well. What, what's going to... Turn to their salvation. Come with me, uh, back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember what Paul's doing here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He, he explains the issue of the God of all comfort here in verse 3. But then in verse 4, he says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we also are comforted of God. He's writing to them because he's in a certain tribulation 
in prison. They're beginning to experience that. And so now he wants to give the comfort. He wants, to tell, he wants, he wants them to know, which they should already know, but, but to, to renew them in that, of the, of the reality of what's going to turn to their salvation as well. And again, salvation is not, is not from it, but how they're going to be like Paul, being in prison, continue to share the word in boldness and without fear. Not faint, not throw in the towel, not shut their mouth when it comes to the word of God, even though they're in prison. And so he's providing for that. He says, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation. And you've got to understand this issue of salvation. Salvation is the act of being saved, delivered, rescued, etc. from some predicament, peril, a peril, destruction, loss of calamity. But again, that doesn't just mean it's, you're, you're taken from it. He's talking about what's taking place inward. He's going through some fear. And he wants that to be saved from that so he can go on and share the message. That, that, that fear doesn't grip him and hinder him from making known the gospel. And, it, and he knows. He knows it's going to turn to his salvation. And, they're, and, and what he's saying here, through your prayer, he's, he's saying, this is why I want you to pray for me. And then he says, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what does that mean? The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I'm running out of time here, but what does supply mean? That was a store. A, a store? Okay. Extra. If if I if I need to go supply supply my uh, go give a supply of food or supply my pantry, what does that indicate? Yeah, but there's something I'm trying to that, that's that's right, but there's something I'm trying to get get at even more. Why would you use that term supply? Yeah. What? Yeah. Meaning? It's part of the comforting. If, if you need to fill something up, you're going to, meaning you don't, right? Meaning you got to supply something because you don't have enough of it. So when he says, and the supply of the Spirit, he, he needs, he's in a, in a state of want. He's, he needs something. And he says, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, he's not talking about some emotion and some feeling and, and get me fired up in, in prison here. He doesn't, he, he doesn't say the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my emotions, according to uh, the, the second giving of the Holy Spirit. Or, or any, but he says, verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my what? Hope. Where did you learn that? Now I'm quizzing you. Romans 8. Come back with me to Romans 8 real quick, and then we'll, we'll conclude and pick this up next time. Romans 8. Look at verse, seven, look at verse 18. For I, remember, Paul, Paul there in Philippians, he knows this is going to turn to his salvation. You get the doctrine right here in Romans 8 that you're supposed to operate upon. And in Philippians, you're supposed to know it and operate upon it and get that supply of the Spirit of, of, of Christ Jesus according to your earnest expectation and hope. Look what he says here. Just notice the terminology. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subject to the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole crea uh, creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Here, they're the first fruits of the Spirit. Philippians, it's a, it's, he needs a supply. He needs a supply of his first fruits. But he, but he says here, the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to, the, to wit the redemption of our body, for we are saved by what? Hope. 
hope. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? Uh, hope for, but if we, we, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? And we, a long time ago, went through Romans 8, this issue of the earnest expectation of the creature, as well as Paul's earnest expectation, and this issue of hope. And Paul knows that even right now, where he's at in prison, that's what's working in him. He needs a supply of that. Here he just got it. It's the, one of the very first things when you're adopted by your father uh, and you learn of that very issue, when this, as you're going to be led by the spirit of adoption, there's some first things you get, first fruits of the spirit. And that is the issue of this, this earnest expectation and hope. And when he's in prison, and, and that's going to work in him to endure and to be comforted and to be saved in his inner man from the sufferings that he's going through, that hope is going to save him. Not from it, but in it. It's going to save him. It's going to strengthen him. And now he says, I, need, I know it's going to turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ Jesus according to my expectation and hope. He's going to get, I need some more. I need that first fruit. When it was first fruit, I need a supply of that. I'm in need of it. I'm going to get it. It's going to turn to my salvation. I know it. And that's what you should be praying for me according to this. When I get the redemption of my body, let, get me focused on that. Teach me about that. Don't give me a false hope saying that God's going to remove you from prison and God's going to do this and God's going to do this. No, God is going to give you the redemption of your body and that's when he's going to deliver you. That's why Paul comes along and says, talks again about in Philippians there, the issue of the boldness and the, the issue of that whether I live or die, Christ may be magnified in my body. Whether I live or die. Because he has this operating in him. I tell you, this edification and the way that God put this book together is so important and so important to understand it. Because you are not going to understand that supply of the Spirit unless you understand Romans 8. And Paul is explaining to them in Philippians, to the Philippians, you've got to get that supply, you got to get that supply filled. You've got to get that supply of the Spirit according to your earnest expectation and your hope. And I've already taught you about that. That's going to, what's going to work. So he's not, it's not a changing of tactic here by the Apostle Paul. He's going back to something that he already has, and he needs that now again, even in this trial. And what's amazing, last thing I'll say, because I'm over my time, is that what you learn in Romans 8, that's going to work throughout your edification. You're going to learn about it uh, how to use it and, and how it's presented a little bit differently, but that's going to remain. But you have the policy of evil trying to do all these different things, but it's going to be this hope that you stand in that is never changing, that, that works effectually in your inner man. And it just shows you the excellency of, the, of, of God's power working effectually in us. What a wonderful thing. We're going to go through, the, uh, we're going to look at that again and go through Philippians, Colossians, and then touch on, touch on some passages in 2 Timothy next time, and we'll end our suffering series. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look at uh, these passages and, and see how this issue advances in Paul's epistles. And Father, I know that we're just going through a survey of this, this issue, but I pray that it, it whets our appetite, that we would further study these things out on our own. And... Uh, and have them be committed to learning them and be committed to having them work out in the detail, details of our lives. And Father, we, th- we thank you that we can, in our lives, in, in our Christian lives, as Paul does there in the Philippians, know what's going to turn to our salvation, know what's going to work when we're in trials, and know that it's, it's coming from you. And know that it's designed to show the excellence of your power and that it makes an impact in the heavenly places. What a wonderful thing. Father, we pray that, I pray if anyone's listening, anyone here who has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would do, they would do that this very moment. The reason why they, would have to, they need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their all-sufficient Savior is because they're unrighteous before you. 
they're a sinner in need to be saved. And because they're a sinner and because they have sinned, uh, your wrath is against them. That's the bad news. Second part of the bad news is that there's nothing they, they can do to get out of that predicament. There's nothing that they can do on their own to escape your wrath and to excuse themselves from your just judgment against them. But the good news is that you, Father, have done something on their behalf. You sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die there at Calvary, to take upon their wrath, to take upon and, and pay the debt and penalty of their sin for them. And you rose again the third day to give proof and assurance that what, what Christ did on the cross fully satisfied your justice. And now you're offering that freely by your grace to those that will believe it. The way in which they do receive this wonderful gift of salvation, of justification, is through faith and faith alone. If there's any works added to it, it, becomes, it no longer becomes a gift. And it can no longer save them. But when it's received by faith and faith alone, because faith is non-meritorious, it's trusting someone or something to do something for them, then your justice can receive that, and you'll do exactly what you say you will do in the gospel. You'll justify them unto eternal life, meaning you'll forgive all their sins, past, present, and future, and you'll impute Christ's righteousness unto them. And that's unto eternal life. What a wonderful thing. I pray that if, they, if, if whoever's listening that doesn't have that issue settled, that they settle that this very moment. Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or out of necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, according as your word has worked effectually in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.